Well, good morning, Restore. Thank you for joining us today. Today is a virtual only service. So if you've been at home joining us, uh, you're with the whole Restore body today. We, it's a holiday weekend, and so we decided that we're going to regroup a little bit and we're going to go virtual only for this week as we've grown accustomed to doing now during the pandemic anyway. And so we will still continue to do the same things that we always do. We will focus on the Word of God, the worship of God, the community of God, and the mission of God. The way that we're going to do that today is we're going to hear a message from God's Word from 1 Corinthians. We're going to celebrate God through a time of worship with Andrew, who's going to lead us today. We're going to hear what God is doing in our community through a time of announcements, and we're going to encourage one another to live on mission. So as we get into the service today, let me pray for us. One thing I wanted to remind you of right up front is that we will be taking communion today. So if you don't have the elements already prepared, maybe take some time before we get there after the sermon to just grab some bread from the kitchen, some juice, or something that you can use to signify the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Let me pray for us as we continue in worship. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, even during times of distress, during times of difficulty, we know that there is so much more that you've accomplished in your name, that everything we've gained in you is worth so much more. Lord, it's easy for us to, miss, to lose sight of that. It's easy for us to miss all our blessings, but we're so thankful for all that you've done, for this church, for this building, for the communion that we get to celebrate today. Be with us, Lord, in all we do in your name. Amen. Good morning, Restore. Thanks for tuning in. Would you please join me as we sing some songs this morning?
God, thank you so much for this time this morning that we could just come together as the church, even at home, God. I pray that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, in your name alone. Through every battle, every heartbreak, every circumstance,
your bow, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so Well, this is the time where we talk about what's going on in our community, and I wanted to draw your attention to two things this morning. The first is, and I forgot to mention this last week, but throughout the month of October, we're going to have a food drive going on for New Hope. Now, we're looking for very specific items. We're looking for turkey gravy and stuffing. Uh, New Hope is beginning to put together supplies for the upcoming Thanksgiving season, and as you can imagine, during this global pandemic, there will be 
perhaps more people than normal looking for extra assistance to have a special Thanksgiving celebration. And so we are being challenged, and I want to challenge us, that we want to get 100 turkey gravies, 100 stuffings, enough stuff to put together 100 meals. So next time you're in the store, grab stuffing, grab turkey gravy. We'll just keep bringing it here to a table, and that food will be delivered over to New Hope. So please keep an eye on that. Remember to do that throughout the month of October. The second thing that I want to talk about is our continuing services. You know, we, when we put together our regathering plan, we said that in about October, we'd be moving to phase two, which would have us coming inside. Well, you know what? The weather's been so great, and it's been so great having outdoor services that we're going to hold off on phase two, and we're just going to keep staying in phase one, which is gathering outdoors. We have unlimited capacity. The weather has held up, and so as long as we have nice enough weather to keep meeting outside, we want to keep doing that and we'll move to phase two at some point in the future uh, if if the if the weather just gets too bad for us to keep meeting outdoors now i want to thank you all again for those of you who continue to support restore financially you know we could not make it through a period of time like this if we had additional stressors like wondering whether we can keep paying our bills or for those of us on staff whether we can keep getting paid and so we're so thankful that you continue to support the church and that, that we've been able to make it. And, you know, if you haven't been supporting the church because you can't, we understand that as well. Or maybe you just forgot to move your giving online. You can always do that at donate.restoreworship.org. Now I'm going to pray for the offering and just in, in our gratitude and uh, for the gifts that we've received and pray that God would use that even beyond what we could imagine. Father, when we give, when we bring to the table, when we bring forward the small offerings that we have, Lord, a percentage of what it is out of all that you've given us, we expect and trust and hope, Lord, that you will use those resources for greater kingdom growth, that you will do more through those gifts than we could have ever imagined. And so we pray, Lord, and continue to pray that for our church, that we would use whatever you've given us as individuals and families and as the larger community, that we'd use whatever you've given us for maximum glory, for maximum impact, for maximum kingdom growth. Be with us, Lord, in all that we do. I pray this in your name. Amen. About a year ago, one of the headlight bulbs, one of the bulbs on my headlights went out. Uh, thinking myself smart and industrious, I decide that I can figure out how to fix it on my own. And by fix it on my own, of course, I mean go directly to YouTube to find a video on how to change your light bulb. Unfortunately, every video I clicked on involved some, someone telling me their life story. And Hey, what up, light bulb gang? Make sure you like and subscribe so you never miss another light bulb. Uh, so I do what I think we've all done in this situation. I skip around until I find the part that I think I'm looking for, the part that applies to me. The same thing happens when you look up a recipe, you Google cookies, click the first link, and you start reading about how harsh the winters were in the mountains of Tennessee. It becomes second nature. We skip through the parts we think are unimportant to just find the nuggets that we like. The problem comes when we skip parts that are actually very important. Replacing the light bulb in my car should take maybe five minutes, probably faster if you've got smaller hands than me. But I missed a step in my skipping around, and the job took much longer than it should have. Regrettably, skipping to the parts we like is something we do as we study the Bible as well. As Christians, we love to dwell on the super encouraging parts of the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I know the plans I have for you and so many others. Uh, but we tend to skip or at least lean away from the parts that call us to leave our comfort zone or actually do something with our faith. The passage we are going to look at today, 1 Corinthians 13, might be one of the most well-known passages. People who have never darkened the doorway of a church have heard this passage. And like so many online instructions, we run to the part we like rather than engaging with the entirety of what is being taught. Let's pray and we'll jump in. Father, as we look into your word today, let us see things in a new light. Let the meaning of this passage permeate our hearts and minds. Let your words be a call to action for us today as we seek to embrace the love that you have called us to. And let us be the ones that love others as you have loved us. 
as I said, this passage is pretty well known, or at least the four verses from it. If you've been to three weddings in your life, it's a safe bet you've heard those four verses at least twice. But we, the love we are going to talk about in 1 Corinthians 13 is so much bigger than love between spouses. The love Paul is talking about here is the ultimate love, the love from which all our actions should stem. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians comes as a way to heal some of the division that was running rampant in the Corinthian church. Corinth was a big city, and this means it has big city problems. It was young and dynamic, not bound by any tradition. It was a mixture of people from many different origins without a central ethnic identity. Most Corinthian citizens were seeking to shed their former status by achieving social honor and material success. This might remind you of a place that you live. This attitude of success by any means made its way into the church at Corinth, causing division and power struggles. In the letter, Paul urges people to work together for the common good of the gospel. Let's start 1 Corinthians 13 in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic power and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. The Corinthian church was seemingly obsessed with the spiritual gifts. Paul spent all of the previous chapter trying to explain that the purpose of these gifts was to build the body of Christ. We as believers have been given these gifts not to demonstrate our inner power or the intensity of our faith. It's not like some video game where you need to grind out to get to level 15 because level 15 Christians unlock prophecy. This idea probably comes out of pagan worship rituals, thinking that if I sacrifice, sacrifice enough to this idol, the rain will come or my crops will flourish. Paul tells us that each of these gifts was given for the common good. We each get a piece so that we can work together as one body and point others to the glory we have seen. If we could do it alone, we would quickly take glory rather than giving credit to Christ. Teresa of Avila, a 16th century Spanish theologian reformer, wrote, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is going to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which God is to bless people now. We are given gifts for the common good, not as a means to enrich our own lives. In the church of Corinth, instead of helping others, people were using their gifts to gain status, and Paul calls them out for it. What good is your gift if it only comes as a, off as a clattering noise? Paul is calling them to remember the root of their gifts. I have a pastor friend who says that your spiritual gift is any need that the church has that you can fulfill. There's no rank or priority in spiritual gifts. Having this one does not make you more important than someone who has that one. If anything, it just makes you more responsible for that area. If you'd like a deeper dive focused on how you can use your spiritual gifts, you can check out Jeremy's Engage series from last year. And this brings us to the why. Why do we do what we do? Paul wanted the church at Corinth to be inspired to act because of the love they have received not because of the status that could be gained from displaying it. The love Paul is talking about here is the Greek word agape. Our modern English is very limited in how we express love. I love my family. You love your spouse. He loves tacos. All those are grammatically correct to say, but they don't think they really convey the same type of feeling unless someone really loves tacos. In the Greek, there are four main words for love. Eros, which is for erotic love. Philia, which is the love you feel for a friend that is so close you can consider them a brother or sister. And storgi, which is the love between family members or the familial affection. 
when you're tucking your kid in tonight, say, good night, storgi, that kind of love. But the big one is agape love. It is the love that loves without changing. It is self-giving love that yields without demanding or expecting repayment. It is the love so great that it can be given to the unlovable or unappealing. It is love that is unconcerned with worthiness and loves no matter what. It is love so intense and intentional that the English word agony finds its root in agape. As though we can only feel true anguish and heartbreak through something in which we have invested so deeply. Sometimes people will say that agape love is the love God has for the people. However, I think this is too limiting a definition. Agape love is the closest we can come with our human meat brains to understanding God's love, but it is only a sliver of what God's love for us looks like. In verse 3, Paul says that even if I give it all away, but I do it selfishly, I gain nothing. All the things Paul has listed in this section are good things on their own. But we muddy the waters when we use these God-given gifts for something as petty as power or authority or social media clout. Sometimes we make the great mistake of letting go of what is best, reaching for something that is just good enough. God wants us to give the world our best, and that starts by being rooted in agape love. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love because he first loved us. This is the all-encompassing, self-sacrificial, I will do anything for that which I love. Paul defines this love starting in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. One theologian wrote that examining this section is like pulling apart a flower to see why it is beautiful. There is a warmth and earnestness, especially here, that fills our hearts with joy because the God of the universe, the creator of all things, pours this love into us. We feel completeness because in these four small verses, Paul poetically expresses our small beginnings of understandings of how much we are loved. And if we ended there, we could rest easy and fulfilled. And if you are new in the faith, that is all I would want you to know. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. And as far as the gospel goes, this is all we need. And it is enough to start your journey of faith. However, if you've been on this journey of faith for some time and you consider yourself a mature believer, then you must embrace that this is not just a simple definition or a reminder of the gospel. This is a call to action. This is about how we should be loving and serving the people around us. We can love because we, he first loved us. That love we have been given should be overflowing as we express the gifts we have been given. Our means of acting as the body of Christ. Let's walk through this carefully. Hopefully as we dissect this flower, we will still be able to see why it's even more beautiful than we originally thought. The first thing to notice is that Paul avoids the lofty, ethereal concepts of how love feels. Agape love actually has very little to do with emotion, as much more to do with self-denial for the sake of another. He isn't trying to get us to understand what it's like to be loved. Paul starts by giving us two things. Love is patient and kind. Patience is probably the easiest concept for us to understand as a concept, but it's also one of the hardest to unfold into our lives. You'd think it would be easier considering how often our patience gets tested. Being patient is the worst. You have that annoying person at work or getting stuck in traffic, a kid throwing a tantrum, that lady at the self-checkout who's only buying produce and then wants to pay by check. All these things that wear on your last nerve, it's enough to make any of us act in an less than loving way. 
a, a more old-fashioned, some of your translations may say it this way, love is long-suffering. <clears throat> There's a, a subtle elegance to describing patience as long-suffering. It expresses how, as Christians, we are able to take a long view. This is the patience a parent has with a child. If you've been responsible for a child between the ages of two and four, then you know there are days when you are ready to throw in the towel and just give up. But we don't. We love them anyway. We stick with it because we know that this phase is only temporary and we are invested in seeing the person that this child can grow up to be. Love allows us to focus on what's down the road rather than being stuck in the here and now. Jesus fully expressed this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to turn things around or be worthy of his love. He knows all of who you are now and loves you anyway. He knows the person you could become and invites you to pursue a closer walk with him so, we can reach the, so you can reach it with him together. If we can embrace even a fraction of this love, it makes it so the small things that test our patience don't need to ruin our day. We can forgive because we know that we are forgiven. And this ties into love being kind. Kindness goes beyond general politeness. It involves actively working for the good of another person, even a person that annoys you. Where patience is an internal struggle, kindness is a choice. We can feel impatient and annoyed in our heads all day, but still act with kindness to the person that is causing us that struggle. Perhaps kindness is the most important thing we can think about these days when it feels like everyone has forgotten how to do it. How can you show kindness to someone that picked a different political team than you? How can you show kindness in the midst of our pandemic? How you know all the ways you have been forgiven? How can you take that extra second to react in a better way? Paul continues from here to the eight things that love is not. Love is not envious, proud, arrogant, rude, cliquish, touchy, suspicious, or happy with evil. Normally, we could have an issue with this phrasing because it's really hard to define something by what it isn't. What does a car look like? Um, well, it doesn't look like a tree. That is a, not a very helpful answer. However, <clears throat> however, what Paul is doing here is showing us a number of red flags, things that might masquerade as love or things that might, we might use as an ex love as an excuse to do. These things take over love's place and get us to accept or express something that is less than God's best example of love. All these things make us find our completeness in something other than God. When we are envious, we look for our completeness in things that other people have. Envy creates in us a spirit where we become the authority on who deserves what. Instead of rejoicing with those who are rejoicing out of love, envy causes bitterness. Pride or arrogance is another one that we need to actively check ourselves against because it's so easy to fall into. Love is content working anonymously. Beautiful things don't ask for attention. Unfortunately, performance and being seen doing good can become more important than doing the actual good. I heard a story from a youth pastor friend of a, a kid who got removed from a mission trip because they were only going to increase their social media statistics. The love we receive should be an almighty motivation. The love of God is big enough, and when we can be right-minded, we know that any glory accumulated should go towards heaven and not for us. Paul wants us to examine our motives. He wants us to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? And further, are there things that we maybe should stop doing? We all have something that our all-encompassing agape love will go towards, but they aren't always positive. In John 3.19, it says that people love the darkness. Their agape was focused on sin. How can you direct your agape, agape to positive ends? that benefit those around you. Out of love, can you let someone change lanes on the highway? Out of love, can you let someone be wrong on the internet? Out of love, can you release that grudge you've been holding on to for just a little too long? 
when we make an effort to remember the way we are loved God. By God, it helps the little annoyances of our day pass out of our focus. And from that ember of love that we hold in our hearts, we are able to share love with the people around us and the rest of the world. Paul concludes this section by telling us that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. It's too bad that Paul says all things because all things really means all things. When we show love to someone the way Christ showed love to us, we are called to love the whole person, all of them, not just the parts we like. I wish he could have said something like, love some of the things. Even most of the things would have been helpful. Charles Spurgeon, who called these virtues loves for sweet companions, expressed it this way. You must have fervent charity towards the saints, your fellow Christians, um, but you will find very much about the best of them which will try your patience. For like yourself, they are imperfect, and they will not always turn their best side towards you, but sometimes sadly exhibit their infirmities. Be prepared, therefore, to contend with all things in them. Even the most noble among us is still a flawed, imperfect human being with sins, secrets, and struggles. We try to chase after God's call on our life as we continue with all the distractions of our modern world throws in our face. It is in remembering our own human imperfections that we show grace to the people with we interact with. Life is hard. And I hope we can show the same grace and forgiveness we show to ourselves. Like the modern proverb goes, we judge ourselves by our intentions, or we judge everyone else by their actions. I hope you can contend with the all things in others as God contends with the all things in you. How can you show a little more love to your family, your friends, the people you interact with? Paul points out things that we already know. The trouble comes when we need to act on it. As believers, we have access to the, the greatest love of all, and it is from that love that we should act. There will always be things that test our patience. There will always be pettiness and jockeying for a position, but it has no place in the church. Our great example of this, of course, is Jesus. We could replace the word love with Jesus, and the passage would still read as true. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. We are his body. That means that we should be working together as one unit to do the work of showing his love. Because as Paul tells us in verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecy, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. In the Corinthian church, gifts like prophecy and knowledge were seen as the, the heavy hitters. And why not? Who wouldn't want to know more things than, so, than other people know? But Paul wants us to focus uh, to be on the temporary nature of our gifts. Our gifts are just containers, and love is the work. There are times, there, there's a time in the hopefully near future when Christ will return, and all these gifts will no longer be needed because we will have access to the source. As we've seen in the book of Esther these past few weeks, the gifts you have received are given for such a time as this. Not for a time in the future, not for a time when you're totally ready, a time like right now. Now, have you ever felt that tug on your heart uh, to do something that you weren't sure why? We all have things we're good at, things we like doing, and often our gifts will grow out of those areas. But we also have things that we are called to do, and whether we are confident in our abilities or not, we are the ones called to that need. We can feel tempted to wait for perfect moments to volunteer, to express our gifts. Unfortunately, the perfect moment to serve is when the need arises, instead of when you think you're ready to move. This is what it means to be mature. 
choosing to do things because they need to be done, not just because of the bonus you might receive. Paul gives us an illustration starting in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Do you remember thinking like a child? I remember seeing my brother's paycheck from one of his first jobs. I was probably 13 at the time. It was for $248. Clearly, this meant that my brother was now rich. That's like $6,000 a year. Time to buy a sports car and drive it to the moon. We're ready to go. When I was a kid, the fridge was magic, and about once a week, new food would appear inside it. Dishes and clothes got cleaned and put away. I don't know how it happened. It must have been magic. Then a few years later, I got my own job. A few years after that, I got my own apartment. And all the while, learning about taxes and bills and all the other garbage that we have to deal with being an adult. Paul wants us to see that mature believers recognize the gifts they have and use them as an expression of Christ's love. As we put away childish things, it's okay to still want that flashy thing while also knowing we need to use what we already have. We don't need to reach for gifts we don't have because they get more attention. God has called us to use the gifts with which we, he has equipped us and use it to the best of our ability. The book of James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. We should find our joy in using what we have been given as an expression of the love that has filled our hearts. We are the image bearers of Christ. And though sin has clouded that expression such that we see it as a mirror dimly, we know that one day we will be face to face and see the full expression of his love and glory. All that is temporary will pass away. All the questions we had will be answered. All that we know in part now will be known fully. What are the childish things that you need to give up? And Paul wraps up this chapter in verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. In the Corinthian church, Paul saw that what people were pursuing was power and authority. They were misinterpreting and warping the gospel to make it fit their earthly desires. However, the greatest pursuit of Christian life isn't miracles, signs, or wonders. What we are called to pursue is faith, hope, and love. These are not flashy or glamorous. They are simple to state and hard to master, and greater than any single spiritual gift could be. The gifts are precious and given to us through the Holy Spirit, but they should never be the goal of the Christian life. All things, everything we do should find its root in love. The greatest of all things, love motivates and inspires. Love allows us to push past the need for re reward or recognition. We give love and have love and share love. Bigger than romance, bigger than family, love is contagious. By heeding Paul's words and Christ's instruction, we can start a revolution and revival as people see Christians that try to solve problems by being loving rather than being right. Who can you love today? Let's pray. Father, you have given us the highest calling of all, to love those around us, even when we feel like they may not deserve it. Let us be the ones that can love because you first loved us. Guide our hearts and our motivation as we go through our daily lives. Let us be the ones that can put away our selfishness in pursuit of your great mission. Father, we can only do this with your help. Be with us now as we go through our lives. In your name, amen. As I thought about what Chris taught us today from 1 Corinthians 13, it struck me and occurred to me that love is the language of the exile. As we've been talking about what it means to live in exile, what it means to be citizens of another kingdom and yet live here, 
it occurred to me that everything that was set up in the church was intended to be this new way of living for people living in exile, including the Lord's Supper. You know, isn't it interesting that as we've looked at in the book of Esther, that there was this whole story of God's sovereignty taking place without ever mentioning the name of God? Well, isn't it interesting that when Jesus gave his followers a reminder of his work on the cross, he gave them something that was so ordinary something that they would do on every single day that they would come and they would eat bread and they would drink wine. And he said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now, we've formalized that process into taking the Lord's Supper together in our churches or taking communion together. But isn't it interesting that when he gave it to them, he just said, just just do this. Do this at mealtime. Whenever you break bread, whenever you drink wine, remember that it points not only towards the work that I've accomplished on the cross, my body broken and my blood shed, but it points towards the reality of the feast that we will have when we are together again, when God's kingdom comes in fullness. And so as we take this together today, I want us to remember that, that this is the feast, this is the meal of the exile who remembers what Christ has done and looks forward to what he will do. Now, in a second, I'm going to read the scripture to us. But before I do, I want to tell you what we're doing today, something special. And that's that we, during this time, after I read the scripture and pray, I'm going to invite you to take communion in your home together with your family or whoever you have around you. But I'm going to have you get the elements ready. And then you're going to get to take it with us as a staff that we took communion this week together. And we wanted, we wanted to do that and put that on video so that you could take it along with us and we could still have that connection. So in a moment... Uh, we will do that. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to a place that everybody is invited to. There's only one way to take it incorrectly, and that's if you come forward and you think that you have it all together, that you don't recognize that Jesus' body broken and his bloodshed was for you. We need to lay everything down. It's a great time to talk to your children about what this means, what it signifies, what it symbolizes, to remind them that your life, your household, and the community that you're a part of exists because of the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let me read the scripture to us. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table, and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let me pray as we take this sacrament together. Father, thank you that even though we are apart, we still have this connection. We have this communion, Lord, with one another and with you. Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can gather as a body, even if it's virtually. Thank you for this means of grace that we can take, reminding us, Lord, of your blood shed on the cross and your body broken for our sins. Be with us throughout the rest of our day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Say
was grace that taught my heart to hear and grace my fears I hope that this whole service today was a blessing to you. Even though we're virtual, we're meeting in our homes once again, and uh, I'm I'm so thankful that we can still gather this way, and I hope that hearing the word preached, seeing and participating in worship, being in communion together by taking the Lord's Supper, I pray that these things were a blessing and that they sustain you. If there's anything that you need from us or anything you want to communicate, you can do that by going to restoreworship.org and where you can find email addresses, you can find forms for prayer requests if you have them, and anything else that you need is available there. I'm going to pray with us now as we go. Lord, we go out into the world, into a world that looks 
way different this year, even this week, than it did last week and certainly the year before, where there is uncertainty, but there's also hope. Where there's areas of division, but there's also areas of unity. I pray, Lord, that our church would be known for how we love. That we would be people who love one another the way that you have loved us. Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen.